that's sort of reflecting on, on these roadside memorials and so on. I, I found one of the things that fascinated me moving to New York in 95, walking around Brooklyn and so on, was the what I call the New American uh, Memorial, which is all these, uh, you know, you'd find on the doorways or on the sides of uh, kiosks and apartment buildings. They would paint these murals of young people people who died in a, sh sh in a drive-by shooting or whatever, and there'll be huge RIPs and so on. These weren't the monuments that we were used to, weren't the bronze monuments of people who fought and died in war. These are just, you know, 16-year-olds getting shot around the corner. And that inspired this uh, work. The other thing, and all this in, in my thinking relate to what do people want in a democratic society? I mean, someone who sort of experienced both a democratic society and an, an authoritarian society. I think that one of the promises of a democratic society is the so-called common good. There are a couple of things that people expect. You know, they expect the, the liberty to live in peace. They expect some kind of protection from the state. They expect uh, availability of certain amenities um, that, that provide a sense of being human in a civilized society. Um, and in my thinking, one of these would include access to health care. So this particular piece called um, Many Thousand Gone came out of that and the images here are random images that I just generated in to, to represent the masses of Africans at the time in 2000 who were dying from AIDS, um, especially in Southern Africa. And they're anonymous. Uh, AIDS did not discriminate between rich and poor although some people had more access than others and some people had access to knowledge and education about it than others. But woman, man, child, it didn't really matter. Um, right and left, people dying in Africa like flies from AIDS. And some of them were quite well-educated people who did not understand it, did not want to... Um, to realize or recognize that it was an epidemic. One of those, in fact, was Fela Kuti, and some of you uh, might know he, he, his, his brother was in charge of healthcare in Nigeria because he worked with the government. But Fela Kuti thought that AIDS was just something that uh, the West invented. So he didn't seek any help, which is how, uh, very sadly, uh, that great man died. So I sort of made this work to kind of speak to that issue as well. Um, the issue of uh, uh, environmental health has also uh, caught my attention and that's where this particular work comes from. Uh, in 2000, the same year, I was invited to make a, a work in Japan, and I chose to make a work that spoke to the river uh, in that area that was drying up from hydroelectric um, exploitation. And in the process of providing energy for Tokyo, the local industry in, in fishing and agriculture uh, was devastated. Um, so I made this monumental shrine, if you like, to the river. But I also invited the, all the children in the area to do a competition writing poetry about the environment. So we made a, uh, a selection of uh, poems by the children, which became part of the work. This was sandblasted into the work itself. Um, I also think that uh, another pillar of a, a free and democratic society should have to do with gender parity. And this particular work uh, 
was inspired by that. Um, I made images of my heroes among women, um, iconic figures, historical figures, freedom fighters, teachers, uh, doctors, housekeepers. And this work was in fact made at the World Trade Center just a year before it was uh, destroyed in 2011. Um, in fact, the studio where I was doing this residency was destroyed as well. And one of the artists uh, died in, in that tragedy, Michael. So some of, some of, some of the names you might recognize. How am I doing for time? Okay. I began to make work about a freedom of movement um, and the challenges that those entail in my freedom of movement, I mean, across borders. In 2003, um, I had gone to Genoa in Italy for some reason, related to this work, in fact. And the group of seven developed economies at the time. It's now a group of eight. At the time, it was a group of seven, I think. Um, had just had their meeting there, and a young man who was protesting was killed by the police. And that got me thinking about how um, people, including myself, who travel around the world trying to find uh, a better life for themselves, and who are willing to do anything, odd jobs that locals and natives wouldn't do, um, end up being pawns in some huge game that they don't even understand, they're just victims of. And which is what, why this piece is called uh, Game. So I had a, a 101 game, uh, board game pieces. It, was, it looked like chess, but it wasn't chess. Because um, you, you don't have 101 chess pieces. Um, I just used the number 101 to symbolize uh, infinity or the large number of people who have to travel across borders to find um, a better life. And that also somewhat inspired this particular piece. And in 2010, I made a wall in the museum because I've always been interested in the wall itself as a form. Um, and I always believe that a, a wall can serve different purposes. It can be a challenge, but it can be also be a dividing um, mechanism between uh, peoples. But the idea of actually making it physical within the museum space uh, was something that I always wanted to do. And very, very quickly, I'll just run through these images and then um, we'll have opportunities for people to ask questions if I bring up an image that you're interested in finding out more about, um, uh, please do that because I won't have the time to um, talk about them while I'm at the podium. Um, this this particular series of works uh, were works that dealt with uh, the practice of child uh, brides in certain cultures in uh, West Africa. Uh, it was always something that uh, I found very problematic. Um, so these, these came out of that child uh, marriage uh, practice um, among certain cultures, even now in Nigeria and other places in West Africa. Um, and that sort of inspired this, this, that when you have children who are married off at such young ages, of course, it, it basically uh, it destroys their um, opportunities in life. Um, and now we even have worse situations where they're not just married off uh, as child brides, but we've had a number of incidents where they're abducted by all sorts of um, organizations. And um, 
and then married off amongst themselves, which is a, a particularly uh, hideous practice. And that sort of inspired these works. This, these are all called Child Bride. Um, and it's that abduction which uh, came up on world television, the Chibok, Bring Back Our Girls uh, campaign that inspired this particular series. So I, I began to make a number of altars for the Chibok girls. It hasn't exactly brought them back, but I, I, you know, I think it's also my own way of dealing uh, with the extended trauma of the experience. And we've talked about this particular work. Uh, people who, who are into the art world would have known a little bit about this obelisk that um, Alan was kind enough to uh, address. Uh, it, people, you'll be quite welcome to ask uh, questions about it uh, when it's time to have questions and, and answers. Um, the reason just to background it, the reason I chose the four languages that appeared on the obelisk is because these are the four languages that are most spoken in this little town of Castle. It's an instant place because it's it hosts the world's most important or most well-known exhibition of contemporary art, but it's also a small place, you know, in the in the middle of Germany. And Adam and I were joking about it in the morning because they go back and forth. You know, they want to be a global city, um, but they don't act like a global city. You know, they can't help themselves. But anyways, uh, this is my one. This is my my one to last work. Does that make sense? Is that the English? One but one. One but last or last but one. Last but one work. That's the right expression. It's my last but one work off the scale uh, of the obelisk. And this is also in Germany. And it's called uh, Appeal to the Youth of All Nations. Um, you, you can read it anyway. Um, I was invited to make this work in the industrial rare region of Germany. And I chose to use existing structures, leftover industrial structures to make the work and decided that I wanted to make something that is an extension of the ideas embodied in the, um, in the obelisk. So the languages are English, German and Romani. Romani is the language of the people that we call gypsies. And the gypsies of the Romani are Europe's largest minority and most long-suffering perhaps as far as European groups are concerned. Finally, this particular work I just finished in South Africa uh, last, last month in September. In September. Um, and it returns me to an old theme around gender parity and gender-related violence. Uh, in 2013, a young woman, 23 years old, Nakofila Kumalo, uh, was kicked to death on the sidewalk early hours of the morning. And the man who was convicted of this crime was one of South Africa's most important artists. Um, She was a sex worker, and obviously they knew each other. He was a customer. And uh, it, it, it was very interesting because he drove up to her in his Maserati, you know, pulled over, stepped out, grabbed her, kicked her, kicked her to the ground, and kept kicking her until she was lifeless. And then he walks back into the Maserati and drives, and drives off. Um, and I think it's very poignant because we, we like to associate artists and art with a totally different uh, kind of uh, behavior. But artists are just human beings, you know. We're capable of uh, heinous crime as well. 
So I made this monument, and by now you would notice that I make a lot of monuments and memorials. So it's actually more a memorial than a monument. I made this memorial for Nokfila um, Kumalo because although she was 23 years old, her mother could not find any photograph of her when the press went to speak to her. The only thing she could remember was that she liked white and pink flowers. So we made this with, um, I think it was 4,000 petunias, white and pink, um, at the University of Pochetsfrum in, in South Africa uh, in, in September. So I, I want to go back there next year and, and expand the work and maybe have uh, an international um, panel or conference or whatever around the issue of gender-related violence not just in South Africa, but also in many other places. And again, interestingly enough, when I was making this work, there was another artist from uh, uh, India who was in residence, um, someone that I have a, a great deal of respect for. But uh, upon his return to India, he was forced to resign his position. He was the founder of one of the um, biennials in India. He was forced to resign his position because of sexual harassment. So he was caught by uh, the um, fortunately growing Me Too movement in India. So um, I'll stop here because I think I've exceeded my time. But I just wanted to give uh, a broader view of what has caught my attention as an artist uh, in the vein of artists as agents um, through their work in mostly democratic societies where they have the liberty to do that, but also, even more poignantly, in authoritarian societies where uh, they don't have the liberty to do that. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm very honored to speak after um, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, who um, invited us here, and um, Holland Cotter and Olu Gibe, um, whom I met in different roles over the past couple of years only. So we haven't been acquainted for a very long time, but I much appreciate this acquaintance. However, brief and occasional might have been so far. I also would like to thank the Vanderbilt University and all the members of faculty and also the students who hosted us and showed us some of their work um, today. Um, the topic that Maria Magdalena proposes an opening <coughs> conference or lecture in three um, voices Four voices. Um, today seems to be uh, slightly, the, the title might sound generic. These terms art, democracy, and justice need to be um, filled with content and they need to be relived and, and practiced. They have to be put in, in, in some sort of practice in order to show um, some efficiency, practicus. And uh, <clears throat> to begin um, with democracy, um, perhaps, but first let me um, quote, maybe not exact quote, from what my predecessors said today. I recognize this moment of um, 
asking what what art can do already in Maria Magdalena's introduction and there is a lot of um, fairly um, banal and I think slightly redundant discussion lately about the intersection or uh, or a possibility of uh, thinking art and activism together or whether these two um, forms of political expression or attitudes um, go along together well and are somehow possible to to negotiate whether art is a form of activism and so forth but what art can do what can art do that seems to um, go back to to a question that was asked um, a little bit earlier and namely around the year 1800 in um, Germany which was around the peak of um, German um, movement known as uh, pre-romantic moment very uh, very f fruitful moment in German um, poetry and thought where among other things a magazine called Athenium was founded by a number of poets, uh, writers, philosophers, enthusiasts of whom um, two um, French authors who wrote a very interesting book about early German romanticism and namely Jean-Luc Nancy and Ernest Lacoula Bart speak as of the first avant-garde. So the turn of the 18th and 19th century for Nancy and Lacoula Bart is the moment of the birth of the first avant-garde movement, the first avant-garde group, and that would be the German romantics. And Friedrich Hölderlin, a um, German poet, was not exactly a part of that avant-garde, perhaps, because he was an outsider, one could say. He walked his own ways. And he wrote this um, elegy called Bread and Wine, in which he asked the famous uh, question, which in the German language is Wozu uh, Dichter in Dürftiger Zeiten? Um, which translates variously, depending on the translation chosen into English, um, who wants poets in lean times, or what are the poets for in a destitute time, or what are the poets for in poverty-stricken time. And all, all these translations of the very concise German phrase, wozu den Dichter, in dürftiger Zeit um, seem to be somehow adequate and also resonating with um, contemporary question about to uh, about the political necessity of art and political utility of beauty, as Holland Cotter um, uh, in a very precise way um, formulated it before. So I think this political necessity of art doesn't have to be negotiated with the political utility of, of beauty. They, um, they come together. And perhaps it is worth uh, mentioning uh, this other quote from the work of Walter Benjamin, another German author who in the 1934, um, which is precisely the year in which the Nazis are taking over fully in Germany, taking a, a grip on the German society at that time um, noted in, in his essay, Artist as Producer, that um, a work of art should demonstrate no other um, quality if it shows a correct political tendency. And this is a very con controversial formulation, but it doesn't have to be understood as a sort of dogmatically Marxist um, uh, statement that would only be about the, the sort of uh, preeminence of, of content, political content in the, in the work of art. So this is just a few remarks to, uh, to open this um, brief talk, which will rather um, have a, a character of a, <coughs> I hope, walk 
rather than, than, than talk, uh, walk metaphorically through uh, centuries, but also through uh, places. Uh, and I chose three places which are in a very strange, almost mystical or mysterious way connected through this edifice. And since you are all here, many of you probably um, citizens of Nashville or that you left, you've been living here, you, you suddenly recognize the building, <laughs> the edifice. Yes, this is Parthenon, the symbol of, of democracy for some. Why is it a symbol of democracy? Symbol of democracy, well, we, we d don't really know. It's difficult to argue. Um, the original Parthenon, which is illustrated here, was a temple to Athena uh, Parthenis and also to some degree it was a proto-bank in which the statue uh, said to be by Phidias, the important Greek sculptor of classical period, was made of gold and ivory the precious metal and ivory. And this was not only to impress, but it was a kind of physical uh, locus of wealth of the Athenian polis. So the temple on Acropolis what was at the same time a, a kind of bank, because as you know, this monument was of rather enormous size. Um, here, um, another picture, well, this is, this, this is a kind of canonical picture on the left hand side, you see a, a Greek flag proudly. The Greek state in its modern form was founded in the 18, 1820s only, um, after the so-called Greek War of Independence or Greek Revolution, um, where Greeks went against the Ottoman Empire and uh, created a constitutional monarchy ruled in the beginning by, by, the, by the German uh, Bavarian dynasty. Uh, and the first Greek king was a German uh, Bavarian um, Prince Otto von Wittelsbach. Um, 